Okay, we'll get going. So good afternoon, folks, and welcome to what I hope will be an interesting session. I'm Dora Bodie. I'm the chair of the Coburg Ecology Gardeners. We're a volunteer group that maintains the ecology garden down <coughs> by uh, Hibernia Street, uh, just below Legion Village and above the boardwalk. And now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to use a script today because I wrote most of this over the last few days. I've had some spare time and I'm much better at getting things done when I've got too much to do. <laughs> when I don't have enough, well, you know what? I might just watch a game show on TV instead of doing what I should. But to give you a bit of background, I'm a hobby gardener. And as you can probably tell from my gray hair, I've been at it for over 40 years now. And over that time, I've had both vegetable and floral gardens. And I currently take care of the butterfly garden at the Ecology Garden. And if you haven't visited recently, the garden's in absolute full bloom right now and full of birds and squirrels and chipmunks and things. So I'd like to invite you to go on down there, have a stroll through, sit in the gazebo and listen to the birds, or maybe take some food down and have a picnic, because we've got lots of picnic tables. And before I get into the presentation, <clears throat> there are handouts on the table over there. Beyond Blue Box is celebrating their 30th anniversary this year, and they have donated seed packets that contain a bird and butterfly mix. And you're welcome to take as many packets as you'd like. Okay, we've got more than we have people right now. And the printed materials include our Coburg Ecology Garden Map and Guide, and that identifies the various beds in the garden and the native plants and trees that you can find there. And then the other handout contains the Credit Valley Conservation Authority's list of native flowers. And it provides examples of the species of butterflies, moths, and bees that each flower attracts. So it's a pretty useful guide if you're planting a garden. And the City of Guelph's plant list covers native perennials, grasses, shrubs, and trees, and vines for both shade and partial shade. So that's pretty handy too if you're looking to plant something new. So please help yourself to those materials at the end of the presentation. And that's it for my preamble. So let's start off by talking about why we need gardens that are designed to attract birds, bees, and other insects like butterflies, moths, flies, and beetles. These are all pollinators, and they rely on plants, trees, and shrubs to survive and to thrive. Those types of flora provide these hardworking pollinators with food in, front in the form of nectar, berries, and seeds for energy, and pollen and insects for protein. And some varieties of flora also act as host plants, and that's where pollinators lay their eggs. And they do that because when the eggs hatch, that particular plant is what the larva eat to grow. And the overall environment is a place for local migratory and overwintering species to find shelter and to have a rest and to maybe nest. Now on the other hand, over 80% of flowering plants depend on pollinators for fertilization so that these plants can develop food and seed, or fruit and seed. And we humans rely on pollinators to fertilize the farm crops that sustain us. In fact, the Canadian Wildlife Federation estimates that pollinators contribute over a billion dollars to the Canadian economy each year. And so that means pollinators are pretty important to our way of life. And sadly, many species are in decline due to factors like habitat loss, which you can see in the east end of town if you're up around Elgin, mm -hmm. and the use of pesticides and climate change. 
and we can all help mitigate these negative factors by creating bird and bug havens that mimic the natural environment and incorporate native plants. So where do you start? I'm going to go through this as if you're starting from scratch and creating a brand new garden space. So please bear with me while I talk about picking a location and preparing it. These steps also apply if you're redesigning an existing garden because things like shrubs and trees that have reached their mature size, new fences and lifestyle changes will affect the characteristics of your existing garden. Now the first step is to think about the space where you want to put your bird and butterfly garden and how this affects or how this affects where you locate containers or um, for balcony gardens or you know in your backyard. Now for example if you have grandchildren in your life or kids in your life and they love to play chase or kick a ball around in your backyard chances are that the middle of that yard isn't exactly the best spot for a brand new garden and uh, you might find some balls in it and a lot of crushed plants. And in the case of balconies or patios or decks, the placement of outdoor furniture and traffic part patterns and maybe how many parties you have will affect the location of your plant containers because you want them in a fairly safe space in some place where you're not scaring off the birds and bees and fireflies. Then the next step is to get to know the specific space that you have in mind for your garden. And the main considerations here are light and moisture. And depending on how you, big you make your garden area, it can be a mix of full sun, partial shade, and full shade. Or you can decide to create separate gardens that get different amounts of sunshine and just focus the type of planting for that type of light. <clears throat> now butterflies are attracted to sunny areas that are sheltered from the wind, while some birds like cardinals prefer to feed in shadier spots because they're less conspicuous so they don't have to worry about predators as much while they're eating. <coughs> So take a look at the area that you have in mind at different times of day and preferably if you can at different times of year because the sun does move and the environment around it changes. And it's a good idea to make notes because what looks sunny in spring could be fully in shade if you've got a humongous maple tree right there that blocks the sun. Um, also, consider the amount of artificial lighting that might be in the area, like any spotlights or anything like that. This is because moths and a lot of butterfly larvae feed at night. And if it's really bright there, your garden might not be too appealing to them. Now, when it comes to moisture, some of the areas of your garden might be drier than others. For example, if part of the area is on a slope and you get runoff there, it will be moister than, say, a flat area right above that slope. And so it's a good idea to walk around, check it out, same thing, look at it after a rain to see if it's flooded, like the culverts in my area do, or, you know, things like that. Um, and this will affect where you plant your different types of flora because there are plants that like to have their feet wet and a lot of native plants prefer, or they can handle drought, which makes it easier when you have them because you don't have to water as often. And um, the other thing, take a look at any buildings, fences, hedges that may be around and how the movement of the sun affects how they throw shade and whether they stop areas from getting wet. Like most of the time here, I find that the rain comes from um, the east, but right under the eaves on the east side of my garden, it blocks the rain and that area is so dry that all I get growing there are dandelions and ragweed, which is not necessarily what I want, but it fills the area and my neighbors don't mind. Now finally, think about other elements you might want to add to your garden 
And these are things like paths, a bench, some large decorative rocks, or a wood pile for insects. And any of these things add a lot of interest to your garden, but they can also uh, increase the size and affect the shape of your garden. You know, if you have a winding path, you might want to mimic that path along the edge of the garden, that kind of thing. And now at this point, you'll have a pretty good sense of where and how large your garden will be, and whether you want a single bed or a series of beds. And in yards, the next step is to outline the area. And you can do this with spring, or string, not spring. <laughs> but I prefer to use brightly colored extension cords because they're um, a bit heavier, so they'll stay in place, or they'll stay where you put them, especially on a windy day. And they're more visible. Because once you've laid out the perimeter of your space, look at it from different angles, walk around and take a look at it from your porch or deck, the sidewalk, the roadway, and even go in your house and look at it from a window that will overlook that garden. Um, and this is to make sure that you're happy with it from all viewpoints. And if you're not, you just adjust your extension cords until you find something that looks good from everywhere. And those cords will also form your digging guide if you end up digging up grass. If, you have or if you're doing container gardening, it's basically the same idea. Place your pots where you think you want them. Preferably use pots of different heights and different colors because these critters are attracted to different colors and I'll talk about that later. And look at them from different angles to figure out the most pleasing arrangement. When you do this, it's the best to put these containers on stands or on shelves so that you improve the airflow. So, so they're not all crammed together and your plants will be happier once you have them in there. And you never know, a stiff breeze might bring a butterfly by or a couple of errant bees. So now, you know the location and size of your garden, it's time to get to work. Container gardeners have the easiest job. If you're reusing pots, you can either replace all of last year's soil with fresh potting soil, or you can do a 50-50 mix of old and new. Now, if you do the blend, um, it may be a bit low on nutrients, so it's a good idea to add one part compost or manure, which is compost, to five parts of soil and blend it in and that will improve the nutrient content. And it'll also provide better drainage because when you're blending it in, you're breaking up the old soil that may have clumped. If you're changing an existing garden, you have the next easiest job. And basically, if you need to create space for new plants, Remove any existing ones that need new homes and either replant them someplace else in your yard or talk your neighbors or friends into taking them and putting them in the ground. And then if the soil needs amending, put a layer of compost on top and just leave it there and let the earthworms do the work of bringing it in. And they will. We've done that in the garden. There's an area that it's the pollinator garden and it's right across from the gazebo. Uh, we used to have this atrocious thing called Asiatic bittersweet. It's a very invasive vine that takes over an area. That was pulled out. Uh, parks brought front end load loaders to dig it out because the roots were so bad. They put some fresh soil in and that happened in fall and then in spring. We partner with various groups. So the Pathfinders, the 13 to whatever year olds uh, with the Girl Guides came by and they emptied all our com the contents of our three compost bins on top of this area, raked it out, left it there, and you don't see compost there anymore because we had an awful lot of very happy, busy earthworms that dug it all in for us. 
So you can do the same thing with your garden. You don't have to go with the effort of digging compost in. You can just toss it on top and then smooth it out a bit. Now the biggest job is creating a new garden bed in an area that's either grassy or full of weeds. And you've got two options. You can go to the work of digging out the grass and weeds, or you can do something called lasagna gardening. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but no, you can't eat it afterwards unless you put a lot of veggies in there. Um, if you choose to dig, there's a good chance that you'll need to mend the exposed soil, especially if it's been grass, because people stomp all over grass, the soil gets compacted. And you can use compost or triple mix for amending the soil, but in this scenario, it's best to mix the existing soil in a bit with whatever's there so that you loosen it up and that improves the air flow that the plants will eventually have. Now the other option, lasagna gardening, saves you the task of digging out all that grass. And that's a big job because I have done it. And lasagna gardening is best done in fall. So this is a good time to learn about it if you haven't heard about it before. Basically, you build layers of green and brown organic materials on top of the grass or weeds. And by spring, this material will settle, and the grass and weeds will have died, and they're not coming back, and the layers will have broken down and formed compost. So to start this, you out, you've outlined your area, you spread a layer of either heavy cardboard or newspaper that's six to ten sheets thick over your area. And regardless of which you use, make sure that you overlap the edges so that you don't have any exposed spots. Once the area is covered, you wet down the paper so that it stays in place while you put other layers on top. At this point, you start alternating layers of green, nitrogen-rich materials with brown, carbon-based materials, the same way you would with a compost pile. The green materials are things like fruit and vegetables, coffee grounds, tea bags, manure, which you can buy, and clippings from the garden. Just don't include any weed seeds, like if you chop down a weed, throw the, and it's got seeds on it, cut that off and just throw the stem and the leaves in because you don't want to promote all kinds of new weeds coming up in your new garden. Brown materials are dead, leaf, or dead leaves, shredded newspaper or other types of paper. I mean, it all comes from wood, so just tear it up or use your shredder if you have one. Peat moss and straw. And you can get, they've started selling uh, bundles of straw in Home Depot and Home Hardware and places like that. And it's fairly fine, so it will decompose fairly quickly. So now you start building. Um, the brown layers should be twice as thick as the green ones. And you start building with a two to three inch deep green layer that you spread over the entire area. And then you follow this with a four to six inch deep brown one. Okay, so whatever depth your green layer is, your brown one is twice as deep. And then you just keep alternating layers until the pile is one to two feet high and end it with a brown layer because you don't want scraps on top because you might get mice or whoever coming to eat that. And although this will look like, I don't know, one foot is about like that, two feet is about like that, you'll be sitting there thinking, I need to be a mountain goat to plant things here. That stuff does all sink down as it decomposes. So by spring, you'll have a reasonable height garden bed. And um, once you've finished layering, wet it down well so that the water gets into the other layers. You might want to try wetting it along the way, um, but you could find that it gets a little bit muddy and messy while you're building the other layers. 
and then you cover it with a layer of compost or mulch to give it a finished look if you wish. Okay, and you know, if you've used leaves and things, the mulch or compost will keep them in place while it all um, settles down. Now, if you, some of you might be thinking, I don't have compost and I read the news online or I watch it on TV. Um, locally, you can buy compost at uh, landscape supply re retailers like Rock Ridges. And newsprint, unused newsprint, is available at packing supply outfits like Block All Storage on Division. Or if you've got buddies that still read the paper, you can ask them to save theirs for you. Okay? So at this point, we're good to go. Our garden beds and containers are prepped and they're waiting for their new residents. And with this type of garden, the idea is to try to mimic a natural environment. And Mother Nature's prolific, but she's not particularly tidy. So your garden should be on the dense side and include things that might look a bit messy in a classic garden. So if you happen to have a dying tree that has to be removed, leave part of the trunk standing and with you know, branches or heavier branches or whatever that have been left behind, pile some of them in, the, in your garden somewhere. And the birds will nest in the cavities that eventually form in the tree trunk. <clears throat> if you go to the ecology garden, uh, we have uh, what I call the woodland walk. It's, um, it leads from the shed on Hibernia to the gazebo. We had a bunch of aspens that died there. Parks came through. They topped those trees, but if you looked at those tree trunks from the south side, you'll see all kinds of cavities in them, and we have birds that nest in those now. Um, sorry, I'm getting lost in where I am. Oh, okay, and with your branch pile, you'll find that a bunch of beneficial insects will nest in there and they might hibernate, they'll lay their eggs to create more bug, good bugs for your garden. And butterflies also use these wood piles as shelter from wind and rain. They also use shrubs, but they kind of like the wood piles too because they're usually hidden somewhere and feel really safe. Now in fall, the garden's also an ideal storage spot for leaf litter. And this provides shelter for overwintering bees and for butterfly and moth pupae that fall off the host plants. It's also a hibernation and breeding spot for a variety of insects that you want to live in your garden. Once spring arrives, we all get an urge to clean up right away and make everything look real pretty. These leaves should be left in place in the garden until overnight temperatures are consistently 10 degrees Celsius or higher. And the reason for that is that the insects' eggs need warmth to hatch, and then their larvae need to be able to emerge from all these leaves and start feeding and become butterflies or bees or whatever. So much as it goes against the grain, please try to leave the leaves in place for a while until it's warm overnight. And then last but not least, don't clean up in fall, okay? There are a lot of plants that are laden with seeds at the end of the season, even when they look dead. And these are a food source for overwintering birds and supplement the bird's diet of berries when pickings are kind of slim. And again, if you go through the college garden in wintertime, you'll see all kinds of stuff standing. We never clean up. Uh, most will break the pathway so that you're not tripping over things when you walk through. Anyway, that's the messy stuff. So let's talk about overall design now. Um, the ideal garden contains flora of different heights, and by flora I mean plants as well as shrubs and trees. 
and they should be positioned to give the effect of a layered canopy, okay? And that's appealing to the human eye, because if you look around you, like even when I look out that window, there are some low shrubs, there are some higher shrubs, there are trees. My eye's drawn to different areas because of that layer. And, but more importantly, different butterflies like different heights of plants. For example, swallowtails, uh, look for tall flowers like joe pie weed or honeysuckle vines, whereas a small butterfly like the skipper is attracted to shorter plants like lavender, dianthus, and asters. So some fly low, some fly high. That's why you want to vary the height. And another important, very important aspect of design actually is to have a variety of flora that blooms at different times so that pollinators have food source from early spring until late fall. And in the paper handout, the Credit Valley um, Conservation Authority handout is a really good reference for achieving that type of length of bloom because it includes bloom times for each plant. It tells you whether it's early, mid, or late season. And that handout also tells you what the plants are going to attract, like what type of birds or, butter or butterflies and bees. Now, newly planted perennials usually take a full season to come into their own. So if you're starting a new garden, including some annuals is a good way to make sure that there are early spring blooms. And most annuals will keep blooming through the whole season if you deadhead them. So it doesn't have to be all perennials. You're free to toss annuals in there. Pick the ones you like. Um, if you have enough room, Spring flowering trees and shrubs like serviceberry, cherry, or viburnum are wonderful nectar and pollen sources for early emerging bumblebees and solitary bees. I have a mature serviceberry in my backyard. It's probably getting close to two and a half stories tall and has a wide spread. And this tree literally bursts into bloom in early May. It's covered with white flowers and the bees just flock to it. I mean, if I get close to that tree, I can hear a buzzing. And then the seeds ripen shortly after that and the tree is absolutely laden. And it's also full of birds and squirrels that are getting their fill. But I, what I find really funny is I get these little chipmunks sitting up like that underneath waiting for the seeds to fall and then go gobble, gobble, gobble. I mean, during that time of year, it takes these birds and squirrels and things maybe two to three weeks to strip that tree. You have no idea how much time I spend sitting out there sipping coffee and just watching the show. It's absolutely wonderful. But any plant like that that has berries in early spring, um, birds, bees will love it, and it can be your entertainment center for a couple of weeks. Now, getting back to the garden, um, other good options for uh, compact shrubs are potentilla and St. John's wort because these flower throughout the full season and they're magnets for butterflies and bees. At the last, my last place, um, I, had a, I had a garden in the middle of part of my yard, uh, right below the deck, and I had a St. John's wort shrub in there. I could sit on the deck and that thing was so covered with bees. I would be probably 15 to 20 feet away and I could hear their buzzing and the shrub was moving, there were so many of them. So I'm a big fan of St. John's Wort, and it is native. Um, for larger shrubs, things like uh, red osier dogwood, uh, chokecherry and ninebark produce berries, and they'll keep the birds happy well into fall, and with the dogwood, you also get the 
added interest in your garden with the red stems. And with when you design your garden, depending on where you plant or put your plants that bloom at different times, you can also create what I think of as a moving garden or a wandering <laughs> garden. Because as early, mid, and late blooms come and, come and go, that movement of color adds a lot of interest to your garden and it also draws your eye to different areas. Um, two houses ago I had one of these and I would be fascinated. I walk around my house because I have gardens everywhere, like you know, this side, that side, that side. And I just stroll around and go, oh, those just came into bloom. Oh, that one's gone, but that green is kind of nice. And it complements the white of that. So it can be very interesting. And it's worth giving it some thought. And frankly, you can always move a plant if uh, it's not where you want it. And on that note, I'll move on to selecting and planting flowers. And I'm going to start with terminology. I've mentioned native plants a few times so far, and these are plants that occur naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, or habitat without any human intervention. And they've evolved over hundreds or thousands of years, and they've developed their own defenses against a lot of plants and or, uh, pests and diseases which is why they tend to thrive in your garden. And they might also have developed different varieties over time through natural cross-pollination. You know, the wind does wonders. And local pollinators have evolved in tandem with these plants over the years. And they search them out as their prefer preferred food sources and host plants because they know what they are, they know they get good food from them, and they know their babies will have something to eat when they're born. Now, there are also hybrids and cultivars, which are also sometimes called nativars, and these are plants that are bred through human intervention to reinforce the desired traits of the parent plants. And these can be things like color, height, disease resistance, so on, whatever someone finds appealing, you know, about the shape of the flower. Hybrids are developed through manual cross-pollination from of two different plants from the same variety. So they'll pick two different types of lilies or daylilies, cross-pollinate them to create a variation. And these are grown from seed, generally. Cultivars are created through grafting or, or tissue cultures, and they're propagated via cuttings. Research is being done on the ecological value of hybrids and cultivars, and the results are really mixed. There hasn't been much done yet. They're just starting to look at this. But most of these types of plants produce nectar and pollen, but research findings so far is that this nectar and pollen has significantly lower nutritional value than that what native plants produce. In fact, they found as low as zero to 20% of the nutritional value in hybrids and cultivars. So this means that pollinators have to work a lot harder to get enough sustenance because they will be attracted to these things, but they're not getting the nutritional value that they need, or they have to you know, work a lot more to get that value. So the moral of this story is that including a high percentage of native plants in your garden provides the best value for pollinators. And native plants that are host plants are also a big help to birds. You might be wondering why, and the answer is caterpillars. Caterpillars are the main targets for birds that are trying to fill or feed a nest full of really hungry babies. So give them a big <laughs> caterpillar, it's worth more than you know, a few seeds. And of course, when they're looking for caterpillars, they're gonna find them on the host plants. 
So you want a mix. You want nectar plants, you want host plants. And the Credit Valley handout, I, I believe, does identify which ones are host plants. So anyway, you're at the garden, you're looking at, or the garden center, you're looking at these labels and there's all this lack, and how can you tell the difference in what you're buying? <clears throat> a native plant is labeled with its full botanical name in, in Latin, followed by V-A-R, which stands for variety, and then the Latin description for the variety. So it might be the Latin word for white or pink or something like that. But if everything's full or in Latin and has VAR in the middle, it's a native, okay? A hybrid is labeled with the first part of the plant's botanical name because both these botanical names tend to be at least two words. So it will be the first part and then it's followed by a capital X, and then the full botanical name that's been given to the hybrid. Okay, so you'll have one word X and then probably two Latin words. And then if you see a label that starts with a botanical name, followed by an English name in single quotes, you're looking at a cultivar. Okay. Cultivars do, are formally named, but they are not given Latin names, or their own Latin name. So there we say have... That again? Say that one more time, I didn't quite get the cultivar. Oh, the cultivar? Yeah. It Same starts cultivar. with the botanical name, and then it's followed by the English name that's been assigned to that plant, and it'll be in single quotes, and each of the words in its name will be capitalized. Okay, so basically, if you're looking for native plants, look for labels where it's all Latin. <laughs> and two words there, two or three words there. Okay, <clears throat> now, so now you know what you're going to be buying, or you know what type of plant you're buying. And while we're at this garden center, let's talk about what to look for in the plants that you're buying. First of all, choose a variety of flower shapes, heights, and colors. Hummingbirds and bumblebees are really happy to visit bell-shaped flowers, but butterflies and smaller bees prefer simple shapes like on a daisy where they have a flat place to land. So you want a mix. Height I've already talked about because of where butterflies fly, and shape, it's because of who it's going to attract. <clears throat> now with color, these butterflies and other bugs have favorite colors that draw them to the garden, okay? Moths like white and light colored flowers because they're flittering around looking for food at night. And what the studies say is that they're most active between midnight and about 2.30, 3 a.m., so it's pretty dark. They need to be able to see the plant. Butterflies are drawn to purple, yellow, and white. Okay, those are their faves. If you're trying to attract hummingbirds, get lots of orange and bright red plants. They love them, and that's why hummingbird feeders are usually red. Um, on the other hand, dull red or red brown, blown, blown, try that again, red brown blooms, I'm not going to say it again, will attract flies, who are also pollinators. It's not a bad thing. Now, if you want to get pollinators' attention while these new perennials are getting established, uh, cosmos, alyssum, marigolds, and calendula are all good choices. These are non-native annuals, but pollinators are attracted to them. And they will visit your garden to see whether, what other goodies you have for them. And when I'm talking about color, it's mainly to get their attention and get them to your garden. Once they're there, they'll flit around and they'll see what's there. And they, you know, a butterfly might land on a red plant and have a nice 
Grace, Sip the Nectar, and Munch Some Pollen. Okay? But those, so think about what you want to attract and focus on those colors. Now, aroma is the other main consideration with plants. Pollinators are drawn to strong scents. So while you're at the garden, if you find it, if you're thinking of buying a plant, you see one that's in bloom, give it a sniff test. Does it have a good or a strong aroma? You might not like the aroma, but the butterfly might, you know? So look for that. Don't get things that just look pretty, but you can't really smell them. And when it comes to aroma, setting aside part of your garden for herbs will also attract butterflies and bees. And then you have the benefit of fresh herbs to enhance your meals that you create, and they are marvelous, I do do this. Now when it comes to herbs, um, lavender is great. It blooms early, has a wonderful scent, and it will keep blooming until hard uh, frost. Chives, mint, basil, sage, and dill also attract both butterflies and bees. They like the flowers, especially chives. And I'll give you a word of warning about two of these. With chives, once the flowers have died, deadhead these puppies, because you're going to end up with chives everywhere. Dill is another one. I made the mistake of planting that one year. I, um, my last house, I converted my front yard into a vegetable garden. All the grass was gone, it was all veggies. And I had tomatoes, I had started doing preserves, and I thought, I can't find dill anywhere, so let me plant some. <laughs> well, it was also pretty breezy in that area. Dill self-seeds. Combine that with the wind, guess what you've got? Everywhere in your garden. So I don't think I'm ever planting dill again, but feel free to do it if you've got a sheltered spot. Um, and, sorry, let me just find my spot again, oh yeah. And the other things that you can plant for butterflies specifically are catnip, fennel, yarrow, uh, which is a fall plant, and parsley, is actually a host plant for swallow tails. So if you do have parsley, it doesn't matter whether it's curly leaf or the Italian variety, if you start seeing dots on it, you've had swallow tails there, okay? Um, with catnip, I've had that in my garden too because I had cats and they love this stuff. In fact, when I planted it for the first time, it's a perennial, or well, it's self seeds actually. I had this little cat, Jamie, and I had a pack of catnip seeds, but I thought, well, maybe I'd better buy a six pack of catnip just in case the seeds don't work. So of course, Jamie follows me to the garden. And I planted the plants first. And then I started scattering seeds, and I happened to look back, and my cat was laying there happy as can be, and all the plants were pulled out and half the leaves were gone. So, if you're not a fan of cats, don't plant catnip, they will find it. If you don't mind cats in your garden, it's a wonderful plant because it has blue flowers on it, if you deadhead it, it will bloom again. And if you have a cat that you let into your yard, my little Jamie, once all the seeds sprouted, actually made a small area for himself where he could lay down in the middle of all of this, have a nap, and then <laughs> when he got in the mood, he sort of go like that, nibble, 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 nibble. So, up to you. Anyway. <clears throat> While we're at this, <coughs> excuse me a sec. Um, I've been talking mainly butterflies and bees, but we don't want to forget about birds. Um, so have a look at shrubs before you leave the garden center. And like I said, things like St. John's Wort and Potentilla are very compact. So you, you, if you've got a decent-sized garden, you can you have 
room for them, or you might decide to make a separate bed for, say, three of these. Um, but the reason for shrubs, they do provide shelter for birds. Butterflies will also go into them if they're trying to get out of wind or rain. It's a safe place to, you know, hang out and not be blown away or washed away. And they're also a habitat for a variety of the insects that birds love to munch. And the town of Guelph, part of the paper handout, is a good reference for native shrubs for both sun and partial shade. But again, go for natives. Um, I came to a talk here a couple of years ago, before COVID, and the person giving the talk was talking about bugs. And what she said is that non-native trees will attract some bugs, but nowhere near as many as a native tree. Like it's a very low percentage and birds want protein. We like to think of them eating berries, we like to and all that, but if you watch a robin on your ring, uh, wall, uh, lawn, I hope you can edit that, <laughs> um, after a rainfall they're going for worms. And when you see woodpeckers in a tree, they're going for insects. And other birds, when they're in shrubs, they're looking for protein. Okay, so if you have the room, look for shrubs, preferably berry producing. But basically, any shrub that's native will be a haven of insects for the birds. And as the last thing, you might want to pick up some grasses. And in winter, a lot of these grasses will provide seed for birds and they also add interest to your garden uh, and you can get to the varying heights. Some of the tall wavy ones can be really nifty to look at. And then in spring when you trim down the old grass, that provides nesting material for our feathered friends. You know, like especially if you have fronds on top of the grass, they love that stuff. They'll probably follow you around on, or in the garden and say, well, are you done yet? I want this. <laughs> now, okay, so now we've spent a whole lack of money, if you're anything like me, when you go to a garden center. And it's time to actually create the garden. And there are two key considerations to placement of plants. First of all, your garden should be a series of mass plantings. So at least five plants together of the same type, okay? And the reason for that is it's more obvious to the pollinators, so it minimizes their search time, and it lets them collect the nectar and pollen much more efficiently. Like if you have five of whatever, and you dot it here, there, and everywhere in the garden, the pollinators won't notice it as easily as if it's all together, okay? Um, the second consideration is that host plants should be placed near nectar plants, because eventually the larvae that hatch on, say, milkweed, butterfly larvae, they're going to munch that milkweed leaf they'll turn into pupa or whatever you call them when they're in the, they're, when, they're, when they're becoming a butterfly, I can't remember what you Larvae, call them. Pupa. Pupae. They'll be that, but then when they emerge, they need nectar plants. And that pupae will be near the host plant, so you want nectar plants nearby. Because then they know, yeah, I can eat here. And, um, those are the main things. So mass planting and host plants near nectar plants. And then when you're planning your floral layout, think about what other elements you might want to add to that garden. So bird baths always welcome because we get some pretty hot weather in summer and we have stretches where we don't have rain. So the birds need water. If you're thinking about a birdhouse, remember or keep in mind that birds like light earth tones and natural wood 
because these are less conspicuous than these brightly painted decorative bird houses that I've seen in Dollarama. Mm -hmm. The birds ain't gonna go to those bright things. They wanna be hidden when they're nesting. And before you put up a birdhouse, it's a good idea to do a bit of research because different species of birds need different sized entrances. So if you've got a small bird, you don't want a big entrance because it's a, there's a high likelihood that some other bird will get in there and take over their nest or might even eat their eggs, you never know. Um, and they also have specific preferences for placement as in how high up the birdhouse is, whether there's one birdhouse or many of the same type, and whether the birdhouse is in an open or sheltered area. Okay, um, in the west end of the Ecology Garden, you'll see what we call the Purple Martin Condo. It's those white bulbs. Purple Martins love to live in groups. They like to be in the open, but they like to be near a wooded area. So that's why it's there. And then the other benefit of that uh, condo is people have told me that sailors that are coming to Coburg are now using it as a landmark to say, yay, we're here, we're almost at the marina. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you won't get that in your backyard, but I just think it's kind of cute. Now, when it comes to butterflies, some of them prefer to feed on rotting fruit, like bananas, strawberries, and oranges. If you decide to provide these goodies, you can keep ants away by filling a shallow dish with water and putting the fruit in the middle of the dish, because the ants aren't going to swim to it. And to discourage wasps, um, replace the fruit frequently or you can um, uh, put some window screening over it and the butterflies will still be able to get at it because they've got that long narrow proboscis but wasps won't be able to get at the fruit. And butterflies also love to rest and warm their muscles in the sun and they need access to water and salt and other minerals too, just like um, birds do. So you can satisfy these needs with something like a shallow flower pot base or a small plastic tray and make some loose mud mix um, by putting some soil with water in the bottom of that container and then put a flat rock in the middle. And Butterflies will sun themselves on that rock and then they'll just sort of reach over and sip some of this mix. So they'll be getting liquid and minerals at the same time. And then we have bees. And I don't know about you guys, but when I think of where bees live, I picture hives. Winnie the Pooh. Oh, my favorite movie, Fried Green Tomatoes with Itchy the Bee Whisperer going up in one of the hives. Well, yeah, there are some bees that do that, but most bees are solitary and they nest in the ground. Not, they don't live in hives. And to create a ne safe nesting habitat, have some loose, undisturbed earth or a patch in your garden and leave that area free of mulch because a lot of native bees are quite small and they can't get through even a thin layer of mulch to create their nests, okay, or burrow into the ground. And then there are some solitary bees that use tunnels like hollow stems of plants or they mm -hmm. burrow into dead wood to lay their eggs. So if you have any existing hollow stemmed plants um, or grasses. Cut some of them back and leave about one foot length standing and the tunnel nesters will lay their eggs in there. Okay. And for burrowers, some fallen wood or brush piles in your garden are wonderful. Preferably wood that's rotting so that they can create their nests easily. And 
one of the myths that we all hear is, oh, I've been stung by a bee. Most bees don't have stingers. Most bees couldn't care less about you. All they want is their pollen and their nectar. In fact, they want you to get out of their way so that they can get at the flower. If you've been stung, the chances are that you've been stung by a wasp. Okay, so don't worry about having these nesting areas for bees. And let's help them out. Now, um, they need access to water and minerals as well. The easy way to do this is just create a shallow depression in the soil and fill it with water. And put a flat rock in there so that the bee, because bees can't swim, and they need a landing pad so they, they, they don't drown in your depression. You know, bumblebees are pretty bloody big, but a lot of bees are really, really small. They don't even recognize them as bees, so they need somewhere to land so that they can get out of that water. And so those are the types of things that you can consider adding to your garden and think about where you're going to put them. You might want to put some sort of outdoor sculpture in there or anything like that. But it's a good idea to think about where you're going to put this type of thing before you plant your plants, okay, because that will determine how you use your space, where the plants have room, where this stuff has room. And now, um, so far we've been talking about pollinators, and they're one of the types of beneficial insects. Okay? There are two other types that keep your garden healthy without using pesticides. And these types are classed as predators and parasitoids. Predators are insects that eat large numbers of other insects. And examples of this group are centipedes and ground beetles, and they'll go after slugs. Uh, hoverfly larvae and ladybugs eat aphids. And there are assassin bugs that feed on flies, harmful beetles, and mosquitoes. And I'll include spiders in this group, although there are arachnids, but they are absolutely voracious predators. They will go after everything, so you want them in your garden too. <coughs> and parasit parasitoids, sorry, I practice saying that, but I still have trouble, are insects whose larvae live on or inside a host insect. And the larvae feed on this host and usually kill it while they're feeding on it. And parasitic wasps, I know it's pretty god awful if you look at any pictures on the internet. Um, parasitic wasps are an example of this group. They lay their eggs in the body of their target and then the larvae feed off of that host. And these wasps ugh, control aphids in the flower garden and tomato hornworms and cabbage worms in um, a vegetable garden. Now to attract our good buddies that help us out, you can plant yarrow, Queen Anne's lace, and shrubs or trees, as I've mentioned. Queen Anne's lace, it can be kind of interesting in a garden, and you do want something that looks like a natural environment, and it will bring the bugs in. Um, as I've mentioned, you can create a wood pile in a shady spot, and that will attract worms, wood lice, millipedes, and centipedes. And let a bit of your garden be a bit wild. You might want to have leaves and twigs or stones near that wood pile, and that's another great habitat for the creeping qualities as I think of them. And finally, creating a compost heap also attracts insects. The worms feed on the rotting matter, insects shelter in the pile, and you might even find that birds come by looking for a yummy snack. Yeah. So, quote Parky Pig, that's all folks. <laughs> <laughs>